Welcome. In this webinar, you will be introduced to form-based codes, a type of zoning. In this webinar, you will learn purpose of zoning, how form-based codes differ from typical zoning, why use form-based code, how to create a form-based code, managing and regulating the code, and pros and cons of form-based code. The purpose of zoning is to manage land uses for public health and safety and to achieve the community's vision as identified in its growth policy. There is a direct connection between planning and zoning. Montana statute requires zoning to follow guidance in a growth policy, which provides an overall vision for the community. A growth policy is a long range plan, typically with a 20 year planning horizon. Growth policies benefit communities that are growing as well as those that may have static or declining populations. With community involvement, the growth policy establishes a broad vision for the future and a roadmap of how to achieve the vision with goals, objectives, and implementation strategies. Once adopted by the City Council or Board of County Commissioners, the growth policy is the community's guiding document for development. It is a policy document, not a law. Growth policies are implemented with a variety of actions and tools, including regulations. Zoning is a regulation enforceable by law. Its basis is in the growth policy, which in addition to goals and objectives, typically includes a land use plan that identifies existing and future land uses, either in text or with maps. The zoning ordinance is the regulation. It consists of details about the zoning in text and a map guided by the general approaches in the growth policies land use section. Zoning background. Form-based code is a relatively new type of zoning. Before we discuss what it is, it's helpful to understand why it came about in the overall context of zoning history. The earliest modern application of zoning was in 1867 in San Francisco to separate dangerous, odiferous, or unsightly uses like tar boiling and dead carcass cremation from other uses like residential. Both residences and these businesses had a right to exist, but not necessarily in close proximity. The legal separation of land uses began creating the foundation for zoning. In 1916, New York City adopted the first citywide zoning regulations. The zoning regulations were a reaction to the construction of the Equitable Building, which towered over neighboring residences. The zoning established height restrictions for the entire city, expressed as ratios between maximum building height and width of adjacent streets. Residential zones were the most restrictive, limiting building height to no higher than the width of adjoining streets. The law also regulated land use, preventing factories and warehousing from encroaching on retail districts. The constitutionality of zoning ordinances was upheld in 1926. In its decision on Village of Euclid, Ohio versus Ambler Realty Company, the U.S. Supreme Court stated that zoning provides advance notice that certain types of uses are incompatible with other uses in a particular district. The practice of separating uses with use districts became widespread across the United States and for decades this has been called Euclidean zoning after the Village of Euclid Supreme Court decision. Most communities in Montana have some form of Euclidean zoning, also described as traditional or conventional zoning. The zoning ordinance typically divides the community into use districts and establishes minimum and maximum requirements for building size and height, lot size, building coverage on the lot, and lot size. Local zoning regulations also may include parking requirements for specific uses. Zoning affects community character. Dividing cities into use districts with traditional zoning has had unintended consequences. One unintended consequence is sprawl. Traditional zoning has led to communities being divided and separated into sectors with zones for small houses, large houses, apartments, shopping, offices, and industry. You need to drive or be driven to get from one use to another. 
Another unintended consequence is that traditional zoning may be an impediment to realizing local visions for the community. This can be especially true for towns that want to be more walkable or for re-energizing downtowns or historic neighborhoods. A town's growth policy might include a goal for developing vacant lots in established neighborhoods with a mix of residential and retail that reflects historic uses, but realizing that goal could be impossible with existing zoning. The small neighborhood market that was located on a street corner would not be allowed as a new use in a residential district in Euclidean zoning, nor would residential units on upper floors of downtown buildings. Types of zoning. Traditional Euclidean zoning regulates and separates development by land use with zoning districts for categories and subcategories of residential, commercial, office, industrial, and sometimes other. Traditional zoning issues include, one, contributes to sprawl and auto use, two, results in development that can lack a sense of place. Zoning district classifications are typically citywide and don't account for differences in neighborhoods. Three, inability to mix uses that could coexist. Four, can be an impediment to realizing planned visions for revitalizing neighborhoods and downtowns. And five, it's separate from other policies and regulations like street classifications that affect public space and community character. Over the past few decades, new forms of zoning have been developed to address some of these issues with traditional zoning. Performance zoning, also known as effects-based zoning, it allows for more unusual land uses to move into existing zones if they conform to a fixed set of standards established for that district. It uses performance goals and a points-based system where a developer may apply for credits toward meeting zoning goals by selecting from a menu of compliance options. And some examples of that include mitigating environmental impacts, providing public amenities, or building affordable housing units. Incentive zoning is a reward-based system to encourage development to meet development goals. A reward scale connected to the incentive provides an enticement for developers to incorporate the desired development criteria into their projects. Common examples include bonuses like ability to cover more of the lot when it includes some affordable housing units and height limit bonuses for the inclusion of public amenities on site. Form-based code in the strict sense is zoning based on form, not function or use. In practice, form-based code does not allow for uses that are clearly incompatible like heavy industrial and residential. Form-based zoning regulates development by focusing on the scale, design, and placement of buildings, paying particular attention to their relationship with the street or other public spaces. Communities that implement form-based zoning codes tend to believe that both the look and arrangement of buildings more strongly define a community's character than do the actual uses that take place within those buildings. Because they focus on form influencing function, these codes tend to be employed to promote walkability, transit-friendly development, and more compact settlement patterns. Form-based codes are being used more and more by more and more cities across the nation. In the late 1990s, there were only a handful, but by 2011, there were nearly 150. Form-based code. Put simply, a form-based code is a way to regulate development that controls building form first and building use second. Form-based codes are based on a deep understanding of place, articulated in a master plan or area plan with a clear vision of how a place will look and function. Urban form and public realm are central to form-based codes but absent from the traditional zoning vocabulary. While architecture is about building design, urban form is about the physical design of cities, how the pieces fit together. In form-based code, building form refers to the scale and placement of buildings as well as some design features. The public realm is generally the entire space between buildings on either side of the street. It includes streets, sidewalks, on-street parking, and vegetated areas like lawns and sidewalk boulevards. Private land in the public realm does not make it public space, but it is space that is seen by the public and therefore shapes how one experiences the area. Form-based codes are not an all or nothing approach to city zoning. Many communities use form-based codes only in some locations and traditional zoning elsewhere. 
Wherever walkability, public space, and the vibe or character of an area is important, form-based codes are more likely to be effective in achieving those goals than traditional zoning. Building form standards. This slide shows some of the typical components of building form standards. Frontage is the front of the building. Frontage types can include porch and fence, shop front, often with awnings or other types of uh, facade improvements. Frontage may also address the frequency of window and door openings and proportions of openings. The front of the building typically extends along most or all of the street side of the lot to help enclose and define the public area. Building types address other aspects of the building, such as height and mass. Another feature that distinguishes form-based code from traditional zoning is the configuration of the building on the lot. In traditional zoning codes, there are typically setbacks to separate buildings, expressed as minimum setbacks. The intent is to allow setbacks that are wider than the minimum. In form-based code, the setbacks may be expressed as maximum setbacks. For example, for example, a maximum setback of two feet would mean that you could bump right up to the lot length, but the building could not be more than two feet at any point from that lot line. Form-based codes typically have reduced parking requirements compared to traditional zoning. If off-street parking is required, it would be generally required at the rear of the building or unseen above or below the building. The illustrations on the right do not represent typical parking configurations of most form-based code in downtowns, but they could be appropriate for other uh, areas. The two illustrations do highlight differences between form-based code and traditional zoning for building orientation, height, and mass. In traditional zoning, the lot coverage may be a maximum standard, allowing the owner to develop a small one-story building with covered parking anywhere on the lot as shown in the upper image. In the lower image, the two-story building at the intersection with an inviting facade facing the street, built to the lot line, additional trees, and with parking now in the rear is more reflective of form-based code. Public space standards. Public space standards regulate elements in the public realm. This includes the street, sidewalks, bike lanes, parking lanes, medians, crosswalks, curbs, gutters, planting strips, and street furniture. Traditional zoning does not include the streetscape. That is usually the responsibility of public works departments. Form-based code does include the streetscape because it is part of the urban form and an integral part of the vision for what people want their community to be. This slide illustrates the difference between an existing and imagined future for Peoria, Illinois. It's difficult to imagine wanting to spend much time in the industrial looking landscape in the upper image. The form of the buildings has changed only slightly in the lower image with more windows and openings at street level, but the real difference is the streetscape. The wider sidewalks, street trees, crosswalks, on-street parking have created an inviting venue. How to create a form-based code. Form-based codes start with a vision and plan for a place. A citywide growth policy is broad and comprehensive and may generally discuss the character of different sections in the city, but stops short of detailed plans for each area. Montana statute allows for neighborhood plans to be included in growth policies, and many communities do develop such plans after the citywide plan is adopted. The neighborhood plan can become an official part of the growth policy through amendment. In Montana, many downtown master plans are adopted into the growth policy as neighborhood plan amendments. Public engagement is essential to de developing a, de a successful code. The form-based code is only effective if it implements a community's vision. To ensure that it truly is the community's vision, not the local government's, you need to engage the public from the start. 
Once the vision is clarified, develop the regulating plan. A regulating plan is basically a fine-grained zoning map and street plan tied to standards. Form-based codes are highly graphic with lots of diagrams and images to clarify standards. Once a form-based code has been drafted, discussed, and thoroughly vetted with various interested constituencies, it is adopted into law by the City Council following zoning procedures in Montana statute. It then becomes part of the overall municipal code, usually as a zoning amendment, but it may also amend other sections of the code, such as street specifications and subdivision regulations. Form-based code components. The form-based code includes the regulating plan map, definitions to ensure technical terms are clear to the general public, graphics and illustrations to show what is intended, and diagrams that show dimension, setbacks, and lot coverage for buildings and details for the streetscape, such as width of travel lanes, bike lanes, sidewalks, and landscaping standards. Additional optional elements in form-based codes. Form-based codes do not typically address architectural standards like materials quality and architectural style, but they are optional. Landscape standards for the streetscape are typically included in form-based code. It is less common to include streetscape requirements for private land other than for the area between the facade and the street. Signage standards and environmental resource standards are also optional. Create a development review process. The review process should be clear, streamlined, and efficient. Persons looking for a project approval need to know what standards are applicable to their particular property, where to obtain an application, and what is needed for a complete application. They will also want to know a, project, a projected timeline for obtaining approval. Criticism of form-based code includes comments including form standards that limit creativity and unique design. It may not address community character and context, especially if the community vision is not clear. Can be expensive to create and implement, relying on consultants, and it may be perceived as not fitting with market realities. For example, can the local economy support that type of development? Advantages of form-based code include placemaking and physical planning are working together. It can be flexible and applied to corridors, neighborhoods, and districts more specifically than traditional zoning. Code is usually shorter, more graphic, and easier to understand for those outside of the architecture planning industries. Form-based code can establish walkable neighborhoods as it addresses the streetscape and public space realm. And it can be an excellent tool for transitioning uses. For example, obsolete manufacturing such as a lumber mill or other industrial areas and rail corridors through cities and towns where older adjoining structures are not in use and need to be repurposed or relocated. Case study, East Billings Urban Revitalization District. The East Billings Urban Revitalization District or EBIRD is an urban renewal district created in part for tax increment financing to fund a large infrastructure deficit in this 400 acre area. Form-based code was considered to both preserve a still active industrial sector and to revitalize the area with an urban mixed use neighborhood. The plan took three years and was completed in 2009. It had strong public engagement from the start, a working group and steering committee design charrette, continuous learning process, a monthly review of draft documents with the steering committee, a final public presentation to kick the tires, so to speak, and an 18 month process before adopting the new code. The vision for this district is to imagine living, working and recreating in downtown Billings in the revitalized eBird urban neighborhood an economically vibrant place that attracts diverse residents 
and businesses and receives national notoriety for sustainable products and practices. The regulating plan has five different zoning districts and there are specific standards for building form and public realm or streetscape for each district. Two industrial forms are restri restricted to one district. Residential and mixed use is allowed in multiple districts in various forms. Each form has specific standards for building siting, including setbacks, minimum and maximum lot width, front lot coverage, front entries like stoops and porches, and front and corner build two lines. Build two lines are essentially a requirement for no setback, building right up to the property boundary as a requirement. Streetscape public realm standards were developed specifically for the eBird. Schematics and standards for each type of street for right of way width, travel lanes, lane width, turn lanes, parking lanes, and curb to curve pavement width, bike lanes, sidewalks, and landscape buffers. Billings case study continued. The standards went beyond the typical perform based code and included landscaping, some specific standards for private development, signage standards, and sustainable development measures. This is based on a reward system like incentive zoning. The reward system includes points for, for example, two points are awarded if you have building energy efficiency or if you've built landscape water efficiency into your design or heat island reduction. One point is awarded for bicycle amenities. The review process, approval is required for new developments. It's issued through building permits. Existing uses can continue until a change in use or other trigger. Change to front of building within the build to zone must meet standards. How is it working? Nicole Cromwell, the building zoning coordinator, responded to that question and said this, as part of our overall zoning code update, we are now creating some new form-based hybrid zone districts for Billings. The intent with these new districts is to help preserve the neighborhood character of the first neighborhoods in Billings and allow developers the opportunity to build new first neighborhoods with the same style and character of the older neighborhoods. Incorporating form-based code in your community. Step one, create goals based on growth policies, master plans, and community input. Develop a vision. Step two, draft building and public space standards. Draft. Step three, draft the review process. Identify who typically reviews, staff, then design review board or other governing body. Step four, illustrate and explain the districts and standards. Step five, allow for public comment and feedback and adjust accordingly. Step six, finalize and adopt. Thank you for listening to this webinar. For more information, visit the Montana Department of Commerce Community Technical Assistance Program online or contact them directly with information on the following slide.